many of y'all have experienced troubling days? Amen. This past week has been an interesting week for myself and my wife and our family. Uh, Sunday after church, we left and went to the Southern Baptist Convention in Nashville, which, by the way, I report that went very, very well, despite what you may be reading in the press. Um, it was a time for unification. It was a time for refocusing on our biblical beliefs of who we are as a denomination. And I'm, I'm very pleased with the way we left that place. Um, we traveled back and that evening my sister had been attacked by a dog and she had to be rushed to the ER and uh, we were praying for her. She had some damage to her lip and puncture wounds on several places in her body as well as lost a fingernail that she'll have to get surgery done on her finger, which is going to be done by the same physician that worked on my finger, so I know she's going to be in good hands. And then 6 o'clock, 6.30 yesterday morning, uh, a tornado or something very close to that touched down in our neighborhood and destroyed parts of my roof and removed fencing and trees, and so I got to wake up to that pleasure. And, it's times like that where you often are troubled and you ask God, why? Why? Why now? Why me? And that is kind of where we're going to find Habakkuk today, asking those questions. And we will see through his prayer that he is seeking answers during troubled times, as we all do. You know, there is a common understanding that we hear about, not only in the church today, but also in the world who believes in God, that we think our God is too small, that we limit him with our own understanding, that we limit him with, with who we think God is without consulting the scriptures. The implication is that we fail to realize just how big God is, just how majestic he is, just how powerful he is, just how involved he is in every aspect of our lives. This passage is a sharp reminder that the Lord not only created the earth, but he also rules over it. God knew exactly where that storm was going. God knew exactly where those animals were going to bite. God knew exactly what was going to take place. God will bring himself glory through those trials that me and my family went through this past week. And we will continue to praise him no matter how that turns out because we serve an awesome and mighty God. And we understand that we can go to him with our questions during those troubling times. God is actively involved in the affairs of nations as well as our day-to-day -day living. He is the God of our salvation. He is guiding history to its ultimate climactic end. God is in control in all things. However, until Christ returns and establishes his kingdom on earth, we will continue to ask questions like Habakkuk. We may wonder how the Lord is going to work all of these things out according to his purposes. The final chapter of Habakkuk, chapter 3, assures us that God will indeed work all things out for the good of those who truly love him. And equally important is the example that the prophet teaches us as we seek answers from God that trouble and burden us. We need to remember that we need to go directly to the Lord. We must seek him in prayer. We must seek him in the scriptures by digging deep. And regardless of the answers that we receive, even if we don't fully understand what he's trying to communicate to us, we must respond to the Lord with thanksgiving. We must respond to the Lord with praise, even in the midst of our trials. And we must trust him to complete his work in his time and not ours. In our prayers and in our songs of praise, we need to acknowledge the glorious work of the Lord. And even as we stand in fear and awe of him and his great power and his might, 
and his control over the things of the universe, even as we're troubled and confused as to why certain things happen. The Lord and his works are truly awesome, majestic, and holy beyond measure. Therefore, he is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our trust. He is worthy of our worship. And if you want answers from him, then seek him as you humble yourself before him and look to the ways that he is working in things around you. We don't know all the things that God is doing behind the scenes. We don't understand how God is going to use something that happened to us to minister to somebody else. So I want you to turn your Bibles to the third chapter of Habakkuk and read with me. And I'm going to break this into three sections as we read along. But first is this. A prayer of the prophet Habakkuk. According to the Shekinah, which is a song with an irregular beat, in case you're wondering. Lord, I have heard the report about you. Lord, I stand in awe of your deeds. Revive your work in these years and make it known in these years. In your wrath, remember mercy. Father, we thank you for the word that you provide us in this passage of scripture. We thank you that it speaks directly to our struggles in life, that it, it helps us to get a better grasp onto the bigger picture. When so often we have our blinders on and we're just looking at the circumstances that we face individually. But we must always understand that you have a bigger goal in mind. That your end goal is that the gospel would go forth. That people would be saved. That we would point them to Christ even in the midst of our struggles, even in the midst of our doubt, even in the midst of our trials. That we will trust you in all things. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege to gather. We thank you for the opportunity to celebrate our fathers today. But most importantly, may you be glorified in what we say and do here. And may our lives be forever changed from what we hear. Lord, I pray today that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be found acceptable in your sight. You are my strength, my rock, and my redeemer. In you and you alone do I place my trust in my life. And may you be glorified through all that I do. In your name. Amen. The first thing I want us to see as we learn to respond to seeking answers during troubling times is that we must pray for the will of God. And I want to remind you that as you pray for the will of God, you may not like the answer that God gives you. This chapter is a, a psalm of prayer. And it may have even been used in temple worship, George First Point. Pray for the will of God. Habakkuk was praying to the Lord earnestly, with awe, with reverence. He wasn't arguing with God. He went to him with a humble heart. He went to him and expressed what he thought, and he shared his emotions with the Lord. He was transparent. And his prayer soon became part of praise and worship. And a scholar by the name of Jacques Selou said this, Prayer is combat with God. It is a struggle. It's not limited to the pious. It is articulating need, recognizing God's ultimate power and authority. When we go to the Lord in prayer, we struggle because we want answers now and God does not always give us those answers. Habakkuk prayed because he recognized God's power. He recognized God's authority and all that he had shared with him in his vision that we looked at in chapter 2. And the word report refers to what God told him. And knowing the will of God should also motivate us to pray recognizing his authority as we seek to understand why things happen. The same God who ordains the end also ordains the means to the end, in case you were wondering. And prayer is an important part of getting to that means. Romans 10, 17 says, So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes from the message about Christ. And without faith, folks, we cannot pray effectively according to Mark chapter 11. 
The reading of the word of God and prayer always go together. And scripture affirms this in multiple places. That we must exercise our faith by reading the word of God and by praying to him as Lord God Almighty. And if we fail to do either one, guess what happens? Our faith suffers. Our faith grows cold. Our relationship seems distant with God. D.L. Moody said this, I used to think that I should close my Bible and pray for faith, but I came to see that it was in studying the word of God that I was to get my faith. So if you want to increase your faith, you need to be in the word of God. If you want to increase your faith, you need to also be in prayer and communicating with God because often how he speaks back to us and gives us answers to those things that are troubling us in life is from the very pages of scripture. Habakkuk prayed because he was overwhelmed by God's splendor. I stand in awe of your deeds, he says in verse 2. He had seen the vision of the greatness of God and who he was, and that vision left him weak, uh, weak and helpless. All he could do in response was to reach out to God in a humble yet bold prayer. Many people have the idea that it's always an enjoyable experience getting to know God in a deeper way. But that's not what the saints of God in the Bible would tell us if they could speak to us. Well, guess what? I've got good news for you. They do speak to us in the pages of Scripture. And let me share with you just a few examples. Moses trembled at Mount Sinai when he gave the law. Joshua fell on his face before the Lord, as did David. Daniel became exhausted and ill after seeing the visions that God gave him. The vision of Christ's glory on the Mount of Transfiguration left Peter, James, and John face down on the ground, and they were filled with terror because of what they saw. And when John saw the glorified Christ in Revelation, he fell at his feet as if he was dead. A wonderful quote from A.W. Tozer is this. To know God is at least the easiest and most difficult thing in the world. Did you hear that? To know God is the, is the easiest and most difficult thing in the world. It's easy to know Him if we exercise our disciplines, but it's difficult to understand what He's communicating to us because His ways are not our ways, and we will struggle with that in our flesh until we have our regenerated bodies in His presence. God certainly has the ability to reveal himself to us, and he can do anything. He can do whatever he chooses. But it becomes problematic for God to find somebody who is truly prepared to meet him. You wonder why you're not meeting God when you come to worship? You wonder why he's not speaking to you? Because what are you doing during the week to prepare yourself to come into his presence? Are you in his word daily? Are you in prayer daily? Are you in fellowship with other believers throughout the week? Are you doing what God's called you to do in obedience, to be a, a, a servant of his, to go and help meet the physical needs of people in the community and around you and even in your own home? Are you being obedient? But instead, we so often fill our minds with the things of this world. We get involved in schedules that keep us doing anything except prayer and, and reading the word of God. And we wonder why we're so exhausted at the end of the week and we come into the church service and we're, we, we fall asleep. It's insane. Why do we keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result? If you want to meet God and you want to truly worship him, come prepared. And I guarantee you, you will see him. God doesn't reveal himself to superficial saints who are looking for some new understanding that they can brag about. Or to a curious Christian who wants to just experience something deeper in fellowship but not have to invest anything. Folks, the Christian journey requires us to invest, not only invest in our relationship with God, but to invest in the lives of others who God places in our life to minister to and to minister alongside. We are the ones who make it difficult to get to know God better because we fail to remember that when we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. James 4 8 tells us that Isaiah 66 2 says, This is the Lord's declaration. I will look favorably on this kind of person, one who is humble, one who is submissive in spirit, and trembles at my word. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 119 120, I tremble in all of you. 
I fear your judgments. When's the last time you trembled in awe when you came into the presence of the Lord? When's the last time you reverently feared God because you were in his presence? Folks, that's what we should be experiencing every day when we go into the word of God, when we humble ourselves in prayer before him. Pray for the will of God. You know what the will of God is? That you should know him and know him more fully. It's clearly spoken in the word. You want to know the will of God? The will of God is that none should die and perish without knowing Jesus is their Savior. And we should be doing everything in our power to fulfill the Great Commission. That's the message God has for us. That is His will. If you want to pray for the will of God, then you must hear it and be obedient to what He shares with you. Habakkuk prayed because he desired for God's work to succeed. Do you pray for God's work to succeed? Or do you pray for God to be some genie to give you the wishes you have for the day? What do you pray for? Do you pray for God's message to go forth? Do you pray for God to use you as a vessel to bring him glory? God told him in Habakkuk 1.5 that he was going to do something. That he was going to do something that he would not believe. When's the last time you saw do something, God do something that just blew your mind? He's waiting and willing to do it on a regular basis if you will just humble yourself before him. The prophet prayed that God would keep that work alive and that God would cause it to prosper. All too often we want to come to God and go, Lord, bless what I'm trying to do. Rather than getting involved and in line with his will and asking God to help you get in line with him. We get it backwards. What God was doing wasn't the work that Habakkuk would have chosen to do. And it may be true of you. Whatever God has called you to do, maybe that's what's hindered you. Maybe that's what's caused you to be afraid. Because you're, you're scared. You don't think you can do it. Well, guess what? You can't. But God through you can accomplish all things. Habakkuk accepted God's plan. And he essentially prayed what Jesus prayed, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God told him that he has to live by faith. That was the only way to live. That was the only way he was going to be successful. That's the only way he was going to live out his faith. So when Habakkuk prayed for God's work to stay alive, he was also praying that his own faith might grow and prosper as well. Finally, Habakkuk prayed because he wanted God to show his mercy. The prophet agreed that the people of Judah deserved to be chastened and punished for their sin. He understands that God is a righteous God and, and he will deal with sin always. And he prayed that God's chastening would work out for their good, but he also asked God's heart to be displayed, that his heart of love would be shown and that he would reveal his mercy to the people as he carried out that chastisement. It was like Moses when he interceded for the people on Mount Sinai. Perhaps Habakkuk had the promise of Jeremiah in mind when he prayed, I know the Lord that a person's way of life is not his own. No one who walks determines his own steps. Discipline me, Lord, but with justice, not in anger, or you will reduce me to nothing. Jeremiah's prayer is beautiful. As is Habakkuk's, Lord, punish me, but have mercy. And did you know that mercy is part of God's character? That's who he is. Habakkuk knew God. He knew that he was merciful, but he also knew that he was just and righteous and that he would have to punish sin. If like Habakkuk, you ever become discouraged about the condition of the church or the state of the world or perhaps even your own spiritual life and how you're maturing, take time to pray and seek God's mercy. Charles Spurgeon said this, he says, whether we like it or not, asking is the rule of the kingdom. Did you know that? If you want something from God, you must ask him. 
So go to the Lord in prayer. James says we have not because we ask not or we ask with the wrong motives and for the wrong purpose. But when we pray for the will of God, God will reveal that will to us. The scriptures will reveal that will to us. And we need to get in line with what he's trying to accomplish and do just that. Then as we look at verses 3 through 15, we need to ponder the work of God. We need to ponder the work of God. God comes from Teman, the Holy One, from Mount Paran. Selah. His splendor covers the heavens and the earth is full of his praise. His brilliance is like light rays and they're flashing from his hand. This is where his power is hidden. Plague goes before him and pestilence follows in his steps. He stands and shakes the earth. He looks and startles the nations. The age-old mountains break apart. The ancient hills sink down. His pathways are ancient. I see the tents of Kushan in distress. The tent curtains of the land of Midian tremble. Are you angry at the rivers, Lord? Is your wrath against the rivers? Or is your rage against the sea when you ride your horses, your victorious chariot? You took the sheath from your bow. The arrows are ready to be used with an oath. Selah. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains see you and shudder. A downpour of water weeps by the deep, or weeps by the deep with its voice and lifts its waves high. Sun and moon stand still in their lofty residence at the flash of your flying arrows, at the brightness of your shining spear. You march across the earth with indignation. You trample down the nations in wrath. You come out to save your people to save your anointed. You crush the leader of the house of the wicked and strip him from foot to neck. Selah. You pierce his head with his own spears. His warriors storm out to scatter us, gloating as if ready to secretly devour the weak. You tread the sea of your horses, stirring up the vast waters. Ponder the work of God. There is a lot of history involved in this section of our passage because what Habakkuk is doing is reminding the Israelites of their history. Most of us have never seen a vision like Habakkuk saw. But because of what God revealed to him and the fact that it's in the Bible, guess what? We get to learn about it. We get to hear about it. We get to see it. And God reveals to us and lets us ponder and learn from it. We know that God reveals his greatness in creation, right? We see it each and every day. When the birds chirp in the morning, when the animals in the woods come and reveal themselves to us, when we have opportunity to be out in, in nature. We see the insects that go about their business. We see the squirrels running about collecting and foraging for their food. We know that God reveals himself in scripture as well. He's revealed himself throughout history. He's revealed himself for all of us to see because we have eyes to see. And guess what? Because of that, we can behold his glory and we can ponder the work that God does. According to some scholars, Mount Perrine is another name for the entire Sinai Peninsula or Mount Sinai itself. Teman is usually identified as Edom, and in this psalm, in this psalm, Habakkuk seems to be retracing the march of Israel from Sinai into the Promised Land. So it's a little history reminder, it's a little lesson for the Israelites who are hearing this, those from Judah, uh, to, to remember what God has done. And everything that Habakkuk speaks about reveals the glory of God. He is called the Holy One. And this is a name that was used by Isaiah at least 30 times. It says a splendor covers the heavens. That's an anticipation when God's glory will be revealed and it will cover all of the earth and no one will be able to deny seeing God in his glory. God's appearance was like lightning that goes across the heavens before a storm breaks. You ever see that cloud to cloud lightning? Oh, that is an awesome experience to see when you're at a safe distance. That's what he's saying. You get to see the awe and the glory of God and his splendor. 
All of creation joined in praising him. He says, the earth is full of praise. God's brightness was like the sunrise, only to a greater degree. It was kind of like what Jesus revealed in Matthew 17 at the transfiguration. He, it says he, he was transfigured in front of them, and his face shone like the sun. His clothes became white as the light. And verse 4 says, rays flashed from his hands. And this is where his power was hidden. Oh, it's going to be an awesome, awesome thing to behold when we look and ponder on the work of God. Verse 5 takes us back to Egypt where God revealed his power and glory through the plagues and the pestilence that devastated the land and took the lives of the firstborn. Those ten plagues were not only punishment because of Pharaoh's hardness of heart, but they also revealed the vanity of their gods in Egypt that they worshipped and thought were mightier and greater than the one true God. Exodus 12 says, Against the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment, for I am the Lord. But this verse also might include various judgments that God sent to Israel when they were disobeying him while they were going through their wanderings in the wilderness. In the Old Testament, God often revealed his glory through such judgments. But in the New Testament, God reveals his glory through Jesus Christ where John says in John 1.14, the word became flesh and it dwelt among us. We observed his glory and the glory is the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth. We have seen God's glory because we have seen Jesus. Where have we seen Jesus? We've seen him in the pages of scripture. We've seen him in the testimony of historical documents. Jesus was God in the flesh, fully man, fully God. We got to witness it. Oh, what a blessing. Pharaoh wouldn't acknowledge the truth. So he didn't get to experience God's grace. What does it mean to become part of the family of God? What does the gospel tell us? That we must believe the truth that Jesus is who he says he is. We must believe that he is the son of God, sent to earth, born of the Virgin Mary. And he was sinless throughout his life. He went to the cross, died in our place, took on punishment that was rightfully ours to purchase us out of the bondage of sin. He bled and he died and he breathed his last in the flesh. He was put in a borrowed tomb. Three days later, just as it was prophesied, he raised from the dead and he received his glorified body. He met for 40 days. Over 400 eyewitnesses saw him. Folks, it is truth. Amen. It cannot be denied. Jesus is who he says he is. And when we confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. Amen. Pharaoh was unwilling to do that. So he didn't get to experience the grace. Invading generals, typically in their warfare, as they seek to gain ground, will either push forward with all that they have or they will surrender and, and retreat. But God did something totally different and so out of character for us as mankind. He simply stood. He stood. And he faced the enemy. The Lord revealed his power when he shook the earth at Sinai before he delivered his law to Israel. The nations that lay between Egypt and Canaan are typified by Cushan and Midian. And those were the people groups that lived near Edom. And as the news of the exodus from Egypt spread throughout the nations, the people were terrified, they were frightened, and they wondered what would happen to them when Israel arrived on the scene. Here this small group of foreigners was coming into their land and God was wiping out everything before them to show his glory because he was fulfilling his promises that he made them. And in verse 8, Habakkuk uses imagery to describe their march to the wilderness as they follow the Lord's promise, uh, his plan rather, to the promised land to claim their inheritance that was rightfully theirs. The Red Sea opened up. What did it do? The Jordan, it opened up. The Egyptians followed in their chariots to go after the Israelites in the Red Sea. And after they crossed, the Lord brought the water down on them. Those chariots sunk. And they were destroyed and their occupants were drowned. But God's chariots are chariots of salvation. 
Verse 9 pictures the various battles that the Israelites fought on their way to Canaan. Battles that the Lord won for them as they trusted him and as they obeyed him as Lord in his commands. Verse 10, we move into the promised land and we see Israel conquering the enemy. God was in complete control of the land. He was in complete control of the water. And he used his creation to defeat the enemies of God. Verse 11, we have the famous miracle of Joshua when the day was prolonged as the sun and the moon stood still so that he would have additional time to win the battle. Can you imagine being there? The day time stood still. Oh, what a day. And he had total and complete victory over the enemy because of what God did. Leading his army, God marched right into Canaan like a farmer threshing grain. And his people claim their inheritance, as we see in verse 12. Now, verses 13 through 15 is a little more difficult because scholars aren't in agreement as to the historical event that's described in these verses. So there's several ideas that they present, and that's what I'm going to share with you. This could be a picture of the nation's deliverance from Egypt. But if it is, Habakkuk probably would have mentioned it. God's anointed would be the nation of Israel, for they were his holy people. Perhaps the prophet is referring to the various times that God had to deliver his people out of bondage and captivity and out of trouble and out of trial, as recorded in the book of Judges. And the anointed one would then be the judges he raised up to bring deliverance. However, perhaps Habakkuk was looking ahead to describe the deliverance of the Lord, of God's people from captivity. God brought the means and the Persians to do what? To destroy Babylon. We've read about that. We've studied that. And then he permitted the Jews to go back into the promised land. We see that in Esther. And the image of God stripping Babylon from foot to neck parallels with what Jeremiah prophesied about that event. So maybe, maybe Habakkuk was looking both forward to the future and also to the past. And he was using that victory to encourage the people to push forward, to trust God, and to know that he would bring them to another victory. In this psalm, Habakkuk describes his holy God and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the God of glory who reveals his glory in creation and throughout history. There is no doubt that's who he's describing. He is the living God. And it makes the dead idols that they worshipped ridiculous. He has God of power. He has control over the sea. He has control over the heavens. He has control over the earth. Therefore, he is the God of victory who leads forth his people in victory and triumph. And guess what? That includes you and me. If we want victory and triumph in our lives, then we need to ponder the work that God has done in our past and also look forward to what he's going to do in the future. Then finally, in verses 16 through 19, we have the opportunity to praise the wonder of God. I heard and I trembled within. My lips quivered at the sound. Rottenness entered my bones. I trembled where I stood. Now I must quietly wait for the day of distress to come against the people invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there is no fruit on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though the flocks disappear from the pen and there are no herds in the stalls, yet I will celebrate in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength. And he makes my feet like those of a deer and enables me to walk on mountain heights. This is one of the greatest confessions and expressions of faith that you can find anywhere in scripture. Habakkuk was facing the frightening fact that everything he knew would be destroyed. They were going to be taken off into exile and some would be put to death. Their land would be left in, in ruins. Jerusalem and the temple would all be destroyed. It would be leveled. It would be nothing left for them to come back to. And it's a pretty grim reality. Yet in all of that, he tells God what? I will trust you. No matter what happens, I believe what you say will come to pass. And I take comfort in that. 
He said, I trembled where I stood. Now I must quietly wait. If Habakkuk would have relied on his feelings and his emotions, he would have never made that great confession of faith. He just wouldn't have done it. As Habakkuk looked ahead, he saw the nation was headed for destruction. He saw that God's wrath would be poured out upon them, and it frightened him. But when he looked within, he saw himself trembling with fear. And when he looked around, he saw everything in the economy about to fall apart. But when he looked up in faith to the heavens, he saw God Almighty and his fears vanished. To walk by faith means that we focus on the greatness and the glory of God. One of the marks of faith is this, that we wait patiently for the Lord to work. The one who believes will be unshakable according to Isaiah 28. When we run ahead of God, we always get in trouble, don't we? And we have examples in the scripture where that happened. You remember what happened to Abraham? He married Hagar and father Ishmael. And did that work out well for him? No, it didn't. But God used it to bring glory to himself. What about Moses? When he tried to deliver the Jews by his own hand, did that work out well? No. Habakkuk chose to wait quietly because he knew that God was in work at work in the world. And he prayed that God's work would be kept alive and that he would be strong. When you know that God is working in your own life, guess what? You can afford to wait patiently and let God have his way and put your own agenda aside. Get on board with him. One more thing to remember here is that God commanded him to wait. Didn't want you to miss that. Has God commanded you to wait? And if you said, no, I'm not going to obey, and you went ahead in your own strength and did the things that you felt were necessary to do in your life and it led to destruction, if God is telling you to wait, wait. It's hard, I know. But it gives us an opportunity to worship the Lord and to be strengthened for the journey ahead and to have our faith increase because God will provide during those moments where we have to wait. Whatever God commands, he will supply the means to accomplish. No matter what we see, no matter how we feel, we must depend on the promises of God and know that he is faithful and we can trust him always. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently on him, the psalmist says in Psalm 37, verse 7. By the time Babylon was through with the land of Judah, there wouldn't be much left of it to value. Buildings would be destroyed. Treasures would be plundered. Farms and orchards would be devastated. The economy would be non-existent. There would be little to sing about. There would be little to praise God about. But God would still be on the throne. He was still working out his divine purposes for his people. And Habakkuk could rejoice in his circumstances, but he could rejoice in his Lord prophet's testimony here reminds me of Paul where he says in Philippians 4 4 rejoice no, excuse me first Thessalonians chapter 5 where he says rejoice always pray constantly give thanks in everything for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus you want to know what God's will is there it is there it is what does it say rejoice always are we rejoicing in our struggles are we rejoicing in our trials are we celebrating who God is when things happen to us that we don't like we need to be. Rejoice always. Rejoice when good things happen. Rejoice when blessings are poured out on us. Rejoice always. Pray constantly. What does constantly mean? Every now and then? No. Constantly means always. Constantly means without ceasing. Constantly means we're always in a state of prayer. We're always going to God with everything that happens. And give thanks in everything. Does it say give thanks in some things? Give thanks only when it's a blessing. Give thanks only when we like what we get. No, it says give thanks in everything for this is God's will for you. Is that where it ends? No, in Christ Jesus. That tells us the only way we can do those things is in Christ 
Jesus. Habakkuk discovered that God was his strength as well as his salvation. And therefore, he had nothing to fear. I don't know what you're facing in your life today. I don't know what struggles you have. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's just a personal struggle you have. You don't need to fear because God is on the throne. Even when Habakkuk's lips were trembling and his legs were shaking, what did he do? He burst out into song and he worshiped God in the midst of his struggle. What an example for us to follow today. When we look around at the world today, we see all kinds of things that I know we don't like. We see all kinds of things on the horizon that we know is coming because history has showed us that when we do certain things, certain things happen. When certain nations did certain things in the past, certain things happened to them. We have history to reflect upon. And we know what's coming. Unless we change our ways and repent. Therefore, God relents. And we're troubled by it. But we don't need to be. We need to be singing songs just like our Lord we need to be singing songs just like Paul and Silas did when they were in a dungeon in Philippi. God can give us songs in the night according to the scriptures. So when it's dark, when it's gloomy, when you're downtrodden, sing praises to the Lord. And if we'll trust him, we will get to see his greatness. Because of Habakkuk's faith in the Lord, he was able to stand and be sure-footed as a deer. He was able to run swiftly and go higher than he had ever gone before. And this is one of the reasons why the Lord permits us to go through trials. Because trials should draw us nearer to the Lord and lift us above the circumstances so that we walk on the heights with him. The Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like those of a deer and he enables me to walk. I love the way this book ends. Habakkuk teaches us to face our doubts. Psalm 118 says, It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of deer and he sets me in high places. Isaiah 40, 30 through 31 says, He will mount up with eagle's wings. God created us to soar. God created us to be in the highest. Did you know that? We don't need to be down in the valley, mulling over our circumstances. We need to be up high and lifted up and praising God in worship. We can take our doubts and questions to the Lord honestly, but we need to do it humbly and wait for his word to teach us. Wait for his response to come to us and worship him no matter how you feel or what you see. William Temple once said, Worship is the nourishment of the mind upon God's truth. Worship is the quickening of the conscience by God's holiness. Worship is the cleansing of the imagination by God's beauty. Worship is the response of my life to God's plan for my life. End quote. What does that tell you? Well, I'll tell you what it tells me. That worshiping God is all that we should be doing. In all things, we should worship him. And it should be the response of our, of our lives because he has a plan for our lives. When Habakkuk started his book, where was he? He was down in the valley. Where was he in chapter 2? He climbed higher and he stood where? In the watchtower. And then he waited for God's reply. And after hearing God's word and seeing God's glory, what happened? He became like the deer bounding confidently through the heights. Notice something that happened here that we shouldn't miss. His circumstances hadn't changed. His circumstances were the same in chapter 1 as they were in chapter 2 as they were in chapter 3. So what happened? He changed his perspective, and now he was walking by faith instead of walking by sight at what he had been revealed to him through the Lord. 
He's walking by faith. You too have the ability to walk by faith. God doesn't always change our circumstances, but he can change us to meet those circumstances with confidence because we trust in him. And that's what it means to live by faith. It isn't easy to live by faith, just like it wasn't easy for Habakkuk. But we must honestly talk to God about our difficulties. We must pray. And then when we pray, we must meditate on the word of God. We must hide it in our heart. And we must be willing to experience that fear and trembling as we recognize who the Lord is and as he reveals himself to us. But let me tell you, it's worth it to get to those heights, to go through those struggles. What took Habakkuk from the valley to the summit? <clears throat> Do you know it's the same things that God can use in your life to take you from the valley to the summit? It's those spiritual disciplines that will take us there. Habakkuk prayed for God's will. Habakkuk pondered God's work. And Habakkuk praised God's wonder. If you and I will do the same, we will be highly and lifted up and we will be praising God in all of our circumstances. Pray for God's will, ponder his work, and praise his wonder. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity and this privilege to go through the journey of Habakkuk's faith. Lord, thank you for speaking loud and clear to us that we have areas we need to improve. We have things that we need to change in our lives. We need to renew our faith in you and we need to trust you despite what things look like around us because you have a plan. Let us pray for your will to be done in our lives and let us be on board with that agenda. And Lord, let us always praise you and worship you for who you are. Let us ponder your works because they are great. Lord, we struggle as we seek answers in this life. And any Christian who's read the scriptures at any length will clearly understand that your ways are not our ways. But we can know this. character never changes and we can always believe and trust what you say to be truth so Lord as we go out into this world I pray that we will continue to seek your will to go and make disciples that we will surrender our will to your will that we will follow your agenda rather than trying to create one of our own pray that you are glorified through it and that we are blessed because we're obedient. And I ask all of these things in the wonderful and precious name of Jesus our Lord.